So I was having trouble trying to figure out what movie I was going to talk about this video. But then I thought, hey, I haven't talked about Keanu Reeves in a minute, so maybe we should do that. So I decided I'm going to talk about the movie that has been most requested in my comments. Just roll it, let's start the video. Let me get this out of the way right now. Point Break is not a good movie. It is an iconic movie. It is a classic movie. And dare I say, it is a great movie. I will not be taking any heresy saying that this movie is trash, okay? You, my audience, are better than that. I believe in you. No, I don't. I don't believe in it. The internet is trash. Point Break was written by W. Peter Illiff and was being shopped around in Hollywood in the mid to late 1980s. Fun fact, Johnny Utah was almost played by vehicular manslaughter himself, Matthew Broderick. Yes, Google it, 1986, Northern Ireland, he did that shit. I'm kind of fucked up he got away with it. But anyways, that would have been directed by Ridley Scott, and uh, do I want to live in a world where that movie came about? Not really, because we have this one. After that movie fell through, power couple James Cameron and Catherine Bigelow came around, and they did some uncredited screenwriting to boost up the script. Cameron got a credit for executive producer, and Bigelow was given the reins to direct, leading to the greatest bank robbery film in a decade full of great bank robbery films. He came out after Point Break, so... Go suck an egg! You heard me. But also, how awesome would it be if the casts were flipped and Al Pacino was playing Johnny Utah and Bodie was being played by good old Bob De Niro himself? I am an FBI agent! hoo I got nipples, Greg. You wanna milk me? Fucking, you know. Make sure to like and subscribe, you know, if you're new to the channel. If you're not new to the channel, also make sure you're likes and subscribe, ring the bell, share if you're feeling frisky. Do all the YouTube stuffs, and uh, let's go. Let's get on to the essay. For those of you unfamiliar with Point Break, go watch it. For those of you who need a refresher, here we go. Johnny Utah, played by a Keanu Reeves, who is, at this point, how old is he? I'm 25. Jesus Christ so young. He's this former college quarterback turned clean-cut FBI agent who gets sent to the LA office, where he will be working in the bank robbery division, because apparently in the 90s LA was the capital of bank robberies in the world, or at least in America, based on, you know, this movie and Heat. And he is what is called a Blue Flame Special. Literally, Two different people reference him as that. I don't know what it means. You're a real blue flame special, aren't you, son? I have been saddled with some blue flamer Quantico cat. Somebody tell me what that term means. Young, dumb, and full of cum. And he takes it upon himself to follow a theory that his partner has that this string of bank robberies perpetuated by one gang who has hit around 30 banks in the last three years are surfers. So he, a kid from Ohio who has never surfed a day in his life, decides to go undercover as a surfer to find out which group of surfers are actually the bank robbers. Yep, solid idea. A plus plan right there. Good job, Keanu. In addition to making this the greatest plan ever, he's using his real name. Johnny Utah, former college quarterback, played in the Rose Bowl, famous person. Like, he's a public figure now working for the FBI, and all I gotta say is, thank God the internet wasn't a thing during the time of this movie, because anybody can just go on the internet and find out what Christian Hackenberg's doing right now. But it's in his learning to surf by finding a teacher through some good old-fashioned state-sanctioned stalking of a woman named Tyler, where he meets this zen, shamanistic surfer, Bodhi, played by Patrick Swayze. And it's here at an evening beach football game, where they tackle each other into the ocean, salty water spraying on their toned 90s bodies as they physically dominate each other, that the real tension of the film begins. It's not the cat and mouse chase of an FBI agent and a prolific bank robber, but the struggle of a young, clean-cut man in probably one of the most heteronormative professions you could think of, and his inner lust 
to live a life he has always wanted. The freedom of living his truth, which may also include romantic feelings towards men and women. So at the beginning of the film, we've got Johnny as this straight-laced FBI agent. He's in a full suit, very apprehensious about surfing and trying to fit in this hyper-masculine jockey environment. Oh, and surfing, by the way, is absolutely a metaphor for bisexuality. I'm not going to explain it anymore. I'm not an English professor. There's no need to explain how a metaphor works, okay? This just is. But at this point, Early on in the movie, he's just trying to go through the motions of being a surfer. He'd honestly prefer to just hang out with the surfboard under his arm and act stoned, as he says. But no, his partner tells him that he has to start living the life to get in good with them. So, he starts to learn how to surf, and almost kills himself. Realizing he needs a bit of help, he gets Tyler to help train him. You know, through the aforementioned stalking. Both parents deceased. Yeah. Definitely. But when he meets Bodhi, time slows down. Literally a whole bunch of slow motion shots of Bodhi surfing a wave. And it is very impressive. But rather than just being a moment where he sees a dude surfing, we can see this as the birth of the realization that Johnny Utah might not be straight. He might be attracted to men. Or, in particular, one man. Patrick Swayze. And who wouldn't be? Look at this movie. You got Keanu Reeves and you got Patrick Swayze. Canada meets America. It is two national treasures in one. After they collide into the ocean, Bodhi says that he recognizes Johnny Utah from OSU and the Rose Bowl. All Johnny feels is elation that somebody recognizes him, that Bodhi recognizes him. After Johnny and Bodhi absolutely body a couple Nazi surfer punks, led by a sockless Anthony Kiedis, Johnny listens to Bodhi's philosophies of surfing. And in the conversation, the body language is clear. You've got Johnny in his wetsuit, all done up like a turtleneck, walking side by side Bodhi, very apprehensive, very out of his element. He looks as if he's not really into it yet. And then you've got Bodhi, who's let his wetsuit hang, he's sun's out, gun's out, he is fully embracing who he is. Bodhi is saying to Johnny that through surfing, he can lose himself and find himself at the same time. Tapping into the spiritual side, living not to just get radical. And Johnny is absolutely attracted to this notion, and Bodhi is equally attracted to Johnny because he sees this potential in him. In another film, this would be the scene where their hands accidentally touch somehow, maybe hesitation to pull away, and they look into their eyes knowing that neither one wants to pull away. But they have to, because Okay, fine, fine, jeez. But seriously, it's the development of a connection that these two characters on opposite sides of the law are beginning to share with each other. It's more than cops versus robbers. It's people finding humanity and attractive qualities in others who don't necessarily fit into your worldview. And this connection is not one-sided, and it's key in this scene. After finding out the other secret that Johnny is an FBI agent and Bodhi is a bank robber, Bodhi comes over and takes Johnny skydiving. There's a tense trading of parachute sequence where everybody just keeps trading Johnny's parachute so he thinks that he's gonna plummet to his death because he didn't pack his parachute because that's not something he knows how to do, but that's not the point of this scene. The important part of the scene is the pure elation that Johnny feels. The look in his eyes. He has been shown a whole new way to live his life, and it's all thanks to Bodhi. This whole sequence is out of place. We as an audience are prepared and fully ready for an action-packed third act, but we get this emotional climax of these characters' relationships to break up the tension. At this point in the movie, they know that the other is the antagonizing force in their lives, but they still come together and hold on to each other's hands in this mid-air pseudo-sexual embrace. Look, it's not explicit, but come on, these two clearly have a thing for one another. To the point where Johnny, after he lands, says you to be losing it. He might even have thoughts of walking away, even if fleeting. 
foregoing his duties as an agent of the state, and letting this man who has shown him a new way of living wander off and chase that 50-year storm. And of course, I didn't forget, I couldn't forget that scene. You know the one. The one you thought I skipped? The one referenced in Hot Fuzz. The one where he's pointing his gun at Patrick Swayze, but he loves him so much, so he goes up and he points his gun up in the air and goes, ah! But that's it. That's the big moment. This is it. After the greatest foot chase ever put to film takes place, Johnny, who has had knee problems because of football, lands badly on his knee and he can't continue the chase, allowing Bodhi to leave him in the dust. And when he points his gun at the man that he loves, he can't do it. I mean, he can. We know he can. The opening shots of the film are a bunch of training montages of him in Quantico, and we are told that he's in the top 2% of his class. But he can't bring himself to do it to pull the trigger. It's really emotional. And what would cause an FBI agent to not kill his target if it's not love? It still counts, you know? Love, much like life, finds a way. So we've all had a bit of fun here, you know, talking about, you know, bisexuality and boy break, isn't it funny, ha ha. But I want to get into a little bit of specificity with film criticism. If you don't mind, let's talk about gaze. So the term gaze is how viewers engage with visual media, and what point of view the filmmakers choose to highlight in specific shots. Well, not specific in every shot, but it gets highlighted in specific ways. It's an intellectual way to talk about who the viewer is and what the object is being looked at as an object of desire. We live in a world where the overwhelming majority of people behind the camera are men, and anyone who has just a passing familiarity with cinema on the internet has probably heard of the term male gaze. It's that money shot where Megan Fox is leaned over under a yellow Camaro in short shorts and a tight shirt. It's clear from that shot that men are the viewers and women are to be looked at. But in this film, whether it be through directorial intent or whether it be the subject matter at hand, we honestly get more skin from men than women in this movie. Literally the only shot that is from the male gaze in the traditional sense is one where Johnny Utah is watching Tyler change while she is covering herself up with a towel. And let's be real, it's not sexy, it's honestly creepy the fact that the shot holds on her for that long. But do we get an instance of a male gaze directed towards a male figure? Yes, the first shot of Bodhi. Slow motion shots of an absolute meal of a man surfing the waves with such skill that one gets lost in those baby blue eyes as easily as one would get lost in the vastness of the ocean without a shoreline to keep us grounded. Yeah. Yeah. But if we're going to discuss the gaze of the film, we only need to look at one scene to try to discern what the intent of the filmmaker was. If we are going to go through my theory that Johnny Utah is struggling with his own sense of bisexuality, then we need to look at his point of view shot in the party scene to really understand what is he focusing on. When you watch that specific shot, it makes sense. Both men and women are looked at and ogled equally. He checks out two dudes before he turns around and he kind of gets infatuated by a hippie chick dancing on a table or something. I don't know. Imagine if the film was shot without the intent of having bisexuality. Well, are you imagining it? Just a bunch of chicks, tight clothes, probably uncomfortable clothes. I'm thinking of what Michael Bay would do in this situation. Maybe throw a car in there because he wants to fuck a car. But in this scene, it's the dudes that have less clothes on than the women. It's not quite the midpoint of the film, as it's 40 minutes into a two hour movie, but it is the midpoint in Johnny's journey of understanding the surfing lifestyle. And possibly, or if you're like me, probably his journey of understanding his own bisexuality. The fact that the male gaze is not necessarily toned down, but is brought to have both male and female objects of said gaze 
is a pretty clear idea that this might be a movie about bisexuality. But you might be asking your screen that you're watching this on, Ned, if this is all about, you know, Johnny starting to like Bodhi, why is it not Johnny's struggle with homosexuality? Well, to this person who I am talking to that thank you for watching, while the actual love story of the film is between Johnny and Bodhi, 100% full stop, I will fight and defend that 100% with anyone who wants to come at me. There is a romantic subplot of the movie, and that is between Johnny and Tyler, played by Lori Petty. So, not exclusively into men or women for that matter. Now, one could argue that the pixie cut that Tyler wears, which is just the way that Lori Petty wears her hair, and the fact that Tyler has a non-traditional name for a woman. This stuff might make you want to read into possibly it is about homosexuality and not just bisexuality, as it could be seen for pushing the boundaries in 1991 while still being, yeah, we're totally straight, it's not about gay people at all. But let's just work with what the film is giving us. Yeah. Despite Tyler being the romantic co-lead of the film, there are instances in the movie where Johnny is clearly not as interested as going with Tyler and that he would prefer to remain with the charismatic magnetism of Bodhi. At the party scene after Bodhi waxes poetically about the 50-year storm in Australia, Tyler quips that there's too much testosterone here and she leaves. The camera goes back to Johnny, who is watching her leave and then looks back at the group almost disappointed that he has to follow her. Like he'd rather stay with Bodhi than go with the girl who has proven that she is interested in him. Does he want to follow her? Does he want to stay with Bodhi? Does he want both? But lucky for him, after he follows her to a room, and she decides to warn Johnny about Bodhi, saying that Bodhi will take him to the edge, even past it. Bodhi shows up with a playful smile and offering him a surfboard to go night surfing. But honestly, the relationship between Tyler and Johnny might not fully work for me, and that might be more of a problem with the film and the script itself and how the, how the story plays out. But I choose to say that it is Johnny not prepared prepared to commit to the hetero life after just being given this new world to explore of bisexuality. The third act, the last 35 minutes or so, are emotionally tied to Tyler, as she has been kidnapped by Bodhi and is held in a place where the only way to save her is for Johnny to do what Bodhi says, and help with a bank robbery. And since Johnny is not a bad person, only a bad FBI agent, he decides to go along to save her. He doesn't like people dying, even though many of his decisions lead to the deaths of many people throughout this film. At least five. That's it. Yeah. Two in the bank, two in the raid, and his partner. Five. So yes, he doesn't like people dying, so he wants to do what he can to save somebody's life when he has the opportunity to do so. Now, the reason why this whole motivation is not a romantic motivation is because it's pretty clear that Tyler broke it off with him the last scene that she was in. She just found out that Johnny was an FBI agent, lied about everything. He lied about having dead parents to a woman whose parents died in a plane crash five years ago or so. So, let's be honest, that's not something you forgive real quickly. A liar! Their entire relationship was built on a lie. But his relationship with Bodhi is built on truth as when they figure out the truth of the other, their relationship gets to be as close as it ever has been. What with the skydiving? Bodhi is masculine, he is confident, he is shirtless most of the time, and he is very shamanistic. He is spiritual, he espouses so much about life, but he's also kind of a bullshit artist. It makes total sense that Johnny in his baby by phase is very attracted to this, this man, this, golden god, drawn into the charisma as he presents this lifestyle that is so freeing. But in the end, his hedonistic lifestyle ends in loneliness. All of his compatriots are dead, and he is standing in the shoreline of Australia looking into the 50-year storm that he is about to surf, dying doing what he loves. He's not so much a hypocrite, just, you know, not what you want for a long-term commitment. Both characters' storylines end here. Bodhi's life and Johnny's commitment to the FBI as he drops his badge on the sand. Which, 
let's be real, is probably a good thing. And that's Point Break. That is the bisexual reading of Point Break from a straight man like me. It's exactly what the filmmakers wanted and it is completely correct and you are welcome. Make sure you do all the YouTube stuff too. Uh, like, share, subscribe, do that stuff. I said it earlier, I'm gonna say it again. This video's almost over. And honestly, let me just say this. Sex is great, but is it as great as the feeling of after your boss yelling and just berating you for your incompetence and asking what exactly you've accomplished, you turn to him and say, Caught my first tube this morning, sir. Literally the most boss feeling ever. Oh shit, Gary Busey! I was in this bureau. It's time for lunch. Oh! Only. Okay. Utah! Give me two. When you were still popping zits on your funny face. I was taking shrapnel and case sod while you were crapping in your hands and rubbing it on your face. Scooby, where are you? You seen a little dog? And jacking off to the lingerie section. I had to kill a guy. And I hate that. It looks bad on my report. <laughs> <laughs> this Calvin and Hobbes is funny. Of the Sears catalog. So yeah, check out the rest of my videos. It's been great. It's been real. Enjoy your day.